We're really pleased to welcome to the podium Tom Carlson. Um, he is a senior lecturer at um, UC Berkeley's Department of Integrative Biology. His primary research interests are in medical, nutritional, ethnobotany, ethnoecology, ethnoepidemiology, and the ecology and evolution of human diseases. He has conducted research with and provided medical care to 40 different ethno-linguistic groups in 15 countries by collaborating with the indigenous and local peoples. His research on local indigenous ethnoepidemiological perceptions of the ecology and evolution of causes and deterrence of human disease include assessments of the interrelationships between ecosystem ecology and human medical ecology. He works to develop systems through which local and indigenous rural communities can be integrated into research projects and programs of ecosystem management, biodiversity monitoring, and human disease monitoring. And he will be speaking today on nutrition, ethnobiology, and global food systems. Delighted to be here today. Uh, I'm in the Department of Integrative Biology, uh, and a strong theme of the Department of Integrative Biology is the study of how evolution and ecology influence biology. Uh, and I'm also uh, uh, connected with the University Herbarium. We have a large collection of plants from all over the world in, in the herbarium as part of the uh, Berkeley Natural History Museums. And, uh, but ever since I was in high school, I had an interest in nutrition, and my approach uh, was to first study botany, to understand plants, their diversity, how they grow, how they interact in ecosystems, and how they interact within biocultural systems with, with people. So uh, I'll be talking a lot about these local food ethnoscience systems, and then we have the global food science systems. Uh, the local food ethnoscience systems, you, you may want to call them indigenous people, tribal people, or local people, but they're local communities. The people engaged in food work uh, do not have college degrees. They usually don't even have a high school diploma. They may not speak or write, they, they, they may not write or read a, any languages, they may speak a half a dozen languages uh, from the area where they live, but these people are very, very active innovators in foods. So the, the field of ethnobiology is how local communities interact with, perceive, manage, nurture, and use their different biological resources. There's uh, the interaction of humans with plants, interaction with fungi, interaction with uh, animals. I'm going to focus more on the ethnobotany. And one thing I do want to reflect on, that if you look at virtually all our foods today, you can go back, the domestication occurred seven to 12,000 years ago, long before there were universities of food science or any types of these global food science institutions. So these were local people doing this in their backyards, interacting with their local ecos ecosystems. And so what we have today are very uh, diverse local people from a diversity of biocultural systems around the world, and these diverse biocultural systems generate very diverse agroecosystems. Miguel Alteri is going to be talking about this. We're, we're used to hearing about monocultures. In fact, if you go to these local systems, they tend to be polycultural systems that are very diverse, uh, multiple <coughs> species being grown in the same field. Uh, and I just might want to add, I, the lineup of people speaking today, I've, I've never seen such a, a, a creative and uh, uh, program conference on nutrition in, in one place. So I'm, I'm delighted to be, be a part of this. Uh, so these uh, agroecosystems produce lots of different food species and varieties, and the push toward monocultures and, and, and genetic homogeneity and so forth is a big threat to the diversity of tra traditional food species and varieties, many of which were developed hundreds of thousands of years ago. Uh, then you have these traditional food cuisines, the way you put these foods together. Uh, fermentation practices, not just for cheeses, but also for to tofu and other foods. These are all things that have been developed 
long, long ago and continue to be innovated on in these local communities. And then there's this diverse culinary herbs and spices that are added into the foods. And we all know how they make them taste better. You know, it's part of the joy of food is, is enjoying these age-old cuisines, okay? But many of these herbs and spices actually stimulate digestive enzymes. You digest them better. And they even add uh, safety to these foods. Many of these herbs and spices have phytochemicals in them that, that uh, will inhibit the growth of, of different uh, uh, foodborne uh, illnesses, such as salmonella, things like this. Now, uh, the foster farms maybe uh, take a cue on that. And they, by the way, delayed their press conference because they want to get more data. OK, it's, it's, it's crazy. But, uh, uh, and so in general, these traditional food diets uh, food systems are healthy, and in fact, they've been the fodder for quite a number of very good nutritional studies that have demonstrated the, the uh, health of these traditional diets. And within these traditional diets, you have uh, lots of phytochemicals, and these phytochemicals are not caloric components of these foods, but we're learning more and more how these phytochemicals in the foods contribute to human health, and also the importance of having plenty of fiber in your diet as well. Uh, much, much research on that. So you can just look at this marvelous diversity of food plants from around the world uh, within the rice varieties, hundreds and hundreds of different rice varieties. And these different varieties aren't just about how they look or taste. They're often varieties that can grow in a very specific ecosystem. Okay, you may be resistant to drought, things like this. Uh, this is one species of bean. Look at all the different colors. Okay. Here's lentils, the same species, a lot of different colors. Here's all these different ways that tofu can be prepared. Uh, lots of different species and varieties of citrus. And once again, these aren't things that were developed in food laboratories in the last hundred years. They've been around for a long, long time. Here's uh, an example of, this isn't uh, cultivated, but this was introduced to me by a Mayan Indian. And yes, it tastes as good as it looks. This is a cactus fruit, the pitaya. Uh, then there's the, the different herbs and spices that are added, the capsicum, the men, uh, menta piperita, the, the peppermint. Interesting, we now have a capsaicin receptor that we've named because we tagged the capsaicin in these. And, uh, and, and watch where they lit up, and they've described the capsaicin receptors. And we even have a menthol receptor, which is a cool activated receptor named, named after these plants. But these are examples of spices and herbs that are put in with the foods. And here's the Starynx from Asia. This is the source for Tamiflu. Tamiflu is derived from a compound that was modified from this species. Interesting. How many physicians know that? I don't know, but okay. So, and here are the local communities, uh, representatives of local communities whose ancestors developed many of these foods, but these local communities continue to uh, do work on the different local foods in these different areas of the world. And so these people, if you're looking at nutritional problems or nutrition programs, should not just be recipients of what the program's uh, uh, objectives are, but actual uh, uh, partners and people who we can get solutions from for local food problems. These are just some of the folks I've had the pleasure of working with over, over the years. So what's interesting, if you look at the way they live, uh, they're, they're living in a local ecosystem, have their gardens, they're harvesting from their, from their uh, local, local ecosystems. Uh, they, they really embody this, this classic locavore slow food lifestyle that we're, we're trying to emulate here, okay? And uh, the way these populations produce, gather, transport, prepare, and consume their foods uh, and medicines has a minimal carbon foot, uh, footprint and therefore mitigates climate change. They're, pro they're providing models for us as ways, ways to live. 
So unfortunately, when the food industry gets a hold of foods, and uh, the, the uh, Marion Nestle's uh, talk was extraordinary. And uh, for the last 10 years, I've been recommending her books to my students, and I'll continue to do this. But they make it more expensive. And if you look at the whole production, there's higher carbon footprints, and there are less nutritious. Okay? And then as many people speaking today will talk about how this contributes to health problems. So what we have is a big evolutionary mismatch. Okay, so the consumption of the processed refined foods, there's an evolutionary mismatch between our modern diets and our ancestral local diets, uh, which results in many of these health problems we're going to be uh, hearing about today. So what I like to do is use the nutritional ethnobotany uh, as, as a method for finding solutions and working with local communities. So... I'm going to give an example first of some international work I've done, and then later I'll talk a bit about some California work I've done where I use uh, ethnobotany as a method. So vitamin A deficiency uh, is, uh, blindness is, continues to be a problem. We have the straight retinol or the beta carotene is too leak linked uh, uh, retinols, uh, intestinal mucosa slices this so you get two retinols. So uh, clearly we know that vitamin A can save sight, and what you have is low vitamin A levels. The, the, the rods in here, rhodopsin reduction is reduced. You get night blindness. You can get dryness of the conjunctiva, and when it becomes severe enough, it can encroach onto the cornea. You can get keratomalacia with ulcers. And generally when you get to that point, there's very, very severe, severe malnutrition. So, here is a child with protein energy malnutrition, vitamin A deficiency. This was in Madurai, southern India. I was working with the Arvind Eye Hospital and Children's Hospital uh, back in the 80s. And uh, this, one thing I do want to point out, this is not the result of, of lack of food. What we have here is dirty water. So there was a big campaign, I remember hearing in the 90s, 80s, Clean water for all by the year 2000, and we're still not there, unfortunately. So what you have is recurrent diarrhea in many of these children that contributes to this severe malnutrition. But it's known that their vitamin A levels will get very low and that if you bolster their vitamin A levels, it can help them recover. So there was this large study by Al Summers, uh, John Hopkins School of Public Health, in Indonesia, and they were giving these large oral doses of uh, vitamin A and uh, published this in Lancet, and this was a very important article that you're probably all f familiar with, but it reduced xerophthalmia by 85% and mortality by 34%. So a very dramatic uh, uh, impact that vitamin A has on our health. And where you can just squirt 200,000 international units into the mouth uh, of, of the, the, the children, uh, and it stores in the liver and has a pretty profound impact. But you can't necessarily get to every child every six months to do this. So uh, I was working at the Arvind Eye Hospital in, in southern India. I was sent there by uh, Larry Brilliant when I was an undergraduate at the University of Michigan. I took a course of his, Hunger Politics and Action, at the University of Michigan Public Health School. He said, I want to send you to India. I said, great, you know, and so he sent me down there and there was this uh, large project on vitamin A deficiency blindness and I was able to work, uh, this was throughout the 80s and early 90s with a number of amazing people including Dr. Ramatola and a study that she put together here uh, in southern India was uh, instead of one large dose, she was giving weekly doses that were kind of comparable to what you might get in the diet and she uh, showed a dramatic uh, reduction in mortality rate. And they, they stopped the study early. The data was, was so compelling, they did not want to give kids placebos anymore. And uh, so this is very dramatic. And so uh, I think what's important, how can we then put things in place to help these local communities be able to get beta carotene into their into the mouths of the kids uh, on, a, on a daily basis. So I did work locally in nutritional ethnobotany looking at good sources of vitamin A. Mangoes are obvious, 
And we've even anecdotally observed that during the high mango fruit season, uh, the vitamin A uh, uh, night blindness levels seem to go down. Uh, uh, I haven't studied this carefully, but anecdotally is very interesting. But here, it's no surprise. This is very rich in beta carotene. Now, what's, what's interesting is uh, you, you have the fluctuation of a food uh, influencing the fluctuate, fluctuation of, of night blindness in these kids. And then we were talking to local people about a, uh, local foods that they had available uh, that they liked to eat, and one of these was a drumstick tree, Moringa olorifera, and turns out, uh, you can see that it, how amazing botany is. Here's the flower. It gets fertilized, and it stretches out this far in terms of the fruit, and these are called the drumsticks, and they would uh, very, very uh, 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 widely eaten, and these trees can grow for many, many decades, provide shade, and also provide these drumsticks for people to eat to get vitamin A. And even the leaves from the trees are good sources of vitamin A right here. And so this was a local solution to their problem, and so there were programs to encourage people to consume more of this drumstick tree and the leaves, and this was something that was locally available. Okay. I looked at this 85 study, and I was always puzzled uh, on this vitamin A incidence here in this part of Africa. So here is you know, uh, the darker areas were the highest amounts I've worked in India. So always, anybody have any ideas what might be going on there? Notice if you look at a place like Nigeria, the southern part, uh, very low rates versus higher rates. It's a rainforest belt, okay? So there must be something in that rainforest that's contributing, okay? So look at red palm oil, 50 or 100,000 on on. Uh, rate with fish oil in terms of beta carotenes. And this is native to West Africa, grows throughout West Africa, very rich in beta carotene, alpha carotene, lycopene, many other carotenoids. Here it is, and you can see uh, here they are collected, and they press them, and they get, get this marvelous oil here sold along the side of the road here, and you can even get it in stores. And certainly, whenever I'd see an infant with this red palm oil dripping down its cheek, I would feel good, okay? Because you have the oils and you have the carotenoids being absorbed. Uh, and, but unfortunately, they took what locally is a very healthy food, and they started introducing the red palm to other tropical areas. And so there is massive deforestation uh, in Southeast Asia and some areas of South America to make room for monoculture uh, plantations of red palms. So here is uh, a forest, here's some deforestation, there's a red palm uh, plantation, okay? So we're having, it looks beautiful, but it used to be a rainforest there. This, this is not good, okay? But what's worse is not only do they bring in this palm, but then you get the food scientists together to turn it into this. This is the refined and bleached palm oil. This is one of the largest palms that contributes to our palm oil today. Very different from the way it's uh, uh, used in, in West Africa. So they bleach the oil, remove the carot uh, carotenoids. Sometimes they even hydrogenate it. It makes the oil less healthy, more expensive, and diminishes both the human health and the ecosystem health. So. When you look at this large-scale agriculture, you also have access to land and nutritional uh, status being impacted as they lose their small farms and gardens to make way for large-scale industrial agriculture. Loss of small farms and gardens is associated with diminished nutritional status. And here's a study, Social Science and Medicine, 1985, where just having land or a garden versus not having a garden or having very little land had a dramatic uh, effect on the levels of night blindness in the children, and even more so the active corneal lesions. So access to land, if communities can get access to land, then they're able to use that land to grow their foods 
And what's really important, when they grow their food, they're able to collect the seeds. The seeds aren't something that they can't collect. I mean, and that's with the GMOs where <laughs> you can't collect your own seeds. That, that's a problem because these people are innovating. Even in refugees areas, I was working in Guinea, West Africa. In the 90s, there were these refugee camps from uh, refugees from uh, Liberia, uh, Sierra Leone, and they would come in here and uh, something happened under the radar screen of, of what you hear about is in fact these people, these refugees were going into the forest collecting plants for foods and medicines, and when they had access to land, they could grow their own gardens. So they take their ethnobotanical knowledge and they're able to uh, uh, help with their adjustment to these situations. So briefly here, now the California nutritional ethnobotany. Now California is an interesting place in that in pre-Columbian times, there really wasn't a whole lot of agriculture, okay? Uh, and uh, so I'm going to be talking about uh, a program I'm involved with, uh, this USDA AFRI grant, Enhancing Tribal Health and Food Security in the Klamath Basin of Oregon and California by Building a Sustainable Regional Food System. The $4 million award, Jennifer Sauerwein, UC Berkeley is the PI on this. I'm, I'm involved with it. Uh, but here is the whole uh, Klamath Basin. And so we're working with Klamath tribes up here, uh, the Karuk tribes here, the Yurok here and the Hoopa. By the way, the, the uh, Karuk, uh, Yurok, and Hoopa are the three largest tribes by population in California. And we work a lot with the Karuk Department of Natural Resources uh, related to this. And our questions are based on what the local tribal communities said were things they wanted to focus on for food security, and that was their traditional foods. Tan oak acorns, hazelnuts, huckleberries, Matsutake mushrooms. Here's a uh, uh, water lily seed. Uh, this is up in the Klamath area. Also the salmon, the eels, the clams, and marine algae on, on the coast. So if you look at California, in a pre-Columbian landscape, acorns were eaten widely, not just in the forest, but even in the dry scrublands. And you can see all these different species and all the different ethnolinguistic groups who were using these species. And they still continue to, to in California in a much reduced form. But here's an image from uh, 1902 of the shucking of acorns by a Madhu couple. Here are these mortars. Uh, within a mile of here, there's a park called Mortar Park in Berkeley where you can see mortars like this that the Ohlone were using to, to pound their, their acorns. This is a, a Miwok. Uh, mortar. Uh, these were acorn graineries in the Central Valley, okay? They were st storing their acorns. Highly, highly developed system. Here's uh, another uh, uh, drawing of, of in the Potman ter territory of, of granaries. And I'm going to be talking uh, just very quickly here about our work uh, with the Karuk. Uh, Hoopa and Yurok. And here is the Nothalitha densiflora, the tan oak up there, which is the main uh, uh, oak. And we're doing ecological studies on that with the tribe. And then we're also looking at this Masataki mushroom, which you get a lot in November. Uh, we're looking forward to it. We're going to go up. But this is a, actually has an association with tan oaks. And also, uh, we are doing work up here in the Klamath Basin, their needs are different. They have these amazing lakes, and there's this water lily. Uh, they get the seeds from it, and they prepare it like popcorn, and it's a very important traditional food. This is an image from the late 1800s, 10,000 acres of locusts, and there's a New York Times article, 1897, on, on these seeds. This is what the Klamath tribes wanted us to work on with them to help re rehabilitate. And of course, we're doing work with uh, uh, the uh, salmon uh, uh, along the uh, Klamath River. This is a friend of ours uh, uh, who, who is a, a fisherman, uh, Ron Reed. And then at the, at the base of the river, uh, we're even looking at marine algae, how they're important with the Yurok. But this is an example where nutritional ethnobotany is very important. And whether you think of it globally or locally to support local communities so they can continue to use these resources and their kids are able to continue to use these resources as well so we can enjoy the rainbows and eat the rainbows. Thank you.